High profile shootings gripped the city of Toronto this past summer. To tell us how new funding from the provincial government will help him fight guns and gang violence in Canada's largest city, we're joined tonight by Bill Blair, Chief of the Toronto Police Service. And Chief Blair, we're glad to have you back in that chair. Good evening, Chief. Just for those who aren't as up on this as uh, you are, we're going to share some statistics, a little background here before we get into our conversation. So if we could, let's bring this up. We're going to start by talking about TAVIS by the numbers, Toronto's Anti-Violence Strategy. That's what TAVIS stands for. It was created in 2006 after the so-called Summer of the Gun, when there was a major uptick in violence that summer. Continuing on, in January 2006, the province committed $51 million to fight gun and gang violence. 72 officers go out daily in teams of 18 to monitor high-risk neighborhoods. More Tavis by the numbers. In July, the province provided $12.5 million in new permanent funding for Tavis and the Provincial and Anti-Violence Intervention Strategies. That's Tavis. And the police say this has contributed to nearly 22,000 arrests. All right, let's go back. How did Tavis come to be in the first place? First of all, Steve, as, you, as you've already mentioned, in 2005, we had a pretty significant increase in the amount of gun violence. And the media characterized it that summer as the summer of the gun, and it culminated in a tragic event on Yonge Street in January 26th of 2005, the Boxing Day shootings. Jane Creeba. The Jane Creeba death. And, and, and so there was, I think, an, a, a strong recognition that we needed to do something to, to intervene in that violence. The $51 million that the province committed to took many forms. Part of it was what we call the Toronto Anti-Violence anti Intervention Strategy. It put a lot more uniform officers out on the street, but it also in, improved our capability through our Integrated Guns and Gangs Unit, through our organ, Urban Organized Crime Intelligence Unit, to gather more information and conduct very effective uh, investigations to dismantle some of the gangs. It was a commitment from the province to add a lot of Crown attorneys and, and prosecutorial resources to holding people accountable who engaged in this violence and there was a lot of investments made in social interventions in our priority neighborhoods. Back in 2004, the United Way had identified 13 priority neighborhoods, underserviced neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. In our own analysis of where violence was taking place, very closely mirrored where services needed to be improved, where, where there's high rates of unemployment and, and poverty. And so a lot of work was also done in those neighborhoods. My Tavis officers are uniform officers. They go into communities, and our job is not simply to, to chase the bad guys. It's to build a better relationship with the communities that we're being victimized, to, to mobilize those communities and improve their capability to keep themselves safe. And so it, it, it has been, frankly, an all-hands-on-deck initiative in the Toronto Police Service. The 72 dedicated officers do that full-time, but every officer, every member of my service has a responsibility to reduce violence and reduce victimization. Do the people who on your behalf go into these neighborhoods look like the people they're servicing in those neighborhoods? Well, very largely, again, since 2005, we've made a very serious effort in the Toronto Police Service to, to have a diverse work service. 50, more than 50% of the people that we hire are, are from two target groups, visible minorities and or women. We've placed a great emphasis on, on language skills for our officers and a, and a great emphasis on cultural and intercultural skills, uh, competencies for our officers, because we know we're working in diverse communities and we need to connect in those communities and we need to make sure that we have a trusting relationship and working very closely with the people that live in those neighborhoods and also other people who serve those neighborhoods in the social services, in our schools and even in the business community to make sure that we're working well together, collaborating and cooperating with each other. We all have the same goal and that's safe neighborhoods. And, and we have, have found that by focusing on reducing violence, you know, traditionally the police have always focused on sort of anti-gang efforts. And, we, and, and, and don't get me wrong, those criminal investigations are important. People have to be held accountable for, for the violent crimes that they commit. But we've placed our greatest focus on reducing victimization, to making our neighborhoods safer and better places to live, to make it less likely that young people will make the choices to get involved in violence give, by giving them better alternatives. And we've done that in partnership with a lot of people in the communities. And I think our neighborhoods are doing better, our schools are doing better, the community services are being more effective, and I think the police have become more effective. And what we've seen are steady and significant declines in violence in those places in our neighborhood, in our city, neighborhoods that were being very, very greatly victimized and, and even terrorized sometimes by the violence that was taking place. We've made them safer places. I, want, I, I think I should get an example of you for, from you on that, because certainly when you pick up the papers, particularly a couple of months ago, and particularly in that one neighborhood in Scarborough, on that one night, it looks like a city that's out of control. Well, I know that's not the case, well, so give me an Steve, example. Let me tell you, certainly Danzig Street, uh, that night in July, was not a safe place. Mm. And the actions of two individuals put an awful lot of innocent people at risk, injured a lot of people, and, and, and took two lives. But that is not sort of 
defining the entire city. What we have seen is, is significant reductions in violence. And, and some of our communities, and I'll give you some examples, uh, in the Melbourne community, we did Project Impact That's a, a in number of years ago in Scarborough. We also did Project Fusion down in the Markham and Eglinton area. We dismantled the gangs primarily responsible for much of the gun violence that was taking place there. Dismantling but, by putting them all behind bars? Yeah, we did very complex long-term investigations where we identify the people most involved in, in the criminal enterprise of these gangs. And we incarcerate them. And, and, and incarcerating them, we incapacitate them from victimizing a community. For how long do you think? Well, you know, it, not forever, but not everybody needs to be in jail forever. I think for, for, for some people, the experience of go to, go to, going to jail uh, can be life-altering and they'll make better choices. For some, uh, they're not going to make better choices. They're just dangerous and people need to be protected from them. And so we'll do our best to protect society from those individuals. But if they're out in two years, I know this is not in your department, but if they're out in two years less a day and probably even less on good behavior or whatever, are you going to have to go through all this all over again in 18 months? Well, uh, certainly they're going, they're going to have our attention, but we've learned a lot, more, a lot about them in our, in our intelligence gathering and through our investigations and our prosecutions. We know more about who's involved in this. Some perspective is really important as well, Steve. I think it's, it's important to recognize that we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of individuals. We're talking about hundreds, and perhaps in total involved in gang activity in Toronto, about 2,000 people. But about 500 of those are the most violent. We know who they are and they have our undivided attention. And, and in, in giving them that attention, when they're in, in, in their communities, we're watching their activities and they know it. When they're involved in criminal activity, they're, they're quickly prosecuted. If they're released on bail, we have a bail compliance program where we go back and we make sure that those individuals are complying with the conditions upon which they've been released. And if they're not, we'll bring them back before the courts. Okay, let me, you, you obviously know how to allocate your resources better than I do, but I'm gonna ask this question as a layman anyway. If 500 people, really bad eggs, are terrorizing two and a half million people in this capital city of Ontario, um, can, can you get people off of doing things that seem less important, like giving out parking tickets and putting them on to things that are much more important, like these terrorists? Well, you know, we have a, a very extensive integrated guns and gangs unit. I've got all of my officers, I've put nearly 500 additional police officers in uniform in neighborhoods, and they're in the neighborhoods where the violence is most likely to take place. We just don't have them randomly patrolling around. We do a lot of analysis of where violence is taking place. And we make sure that our resources are deployed into those places. And not just into those neighborhoods, but into those stairwells. Into the, into the, the, the places where this violence is most likely to take place. Those officers are very effective in their interventions. We conduct criminal investigations because that work has to be done. But we also do a lot of preventative work. And simply the, the, the visible uniform presence, not just, not just having them standing around, but actually engaging with people in communities has made a huge difference. So I Tavis have, is an unambiguous success in this regard, in well, your view. I, I, it, it, Tavis in the context of the rapid response, but it's supplemented by officers who are neighborhood, neighborhood cops. Mm -hmm. And a neighborhood cop who knows his neighborhood, knows the kids in that neighborhood, builds some trusting relationship with them. There is no one policing solution and there is no one societal solution. Mm -hmm to violence in our communities. And if I think we've got to work at this from every direction. But even, you know, my officers, and we have to do parking enforcement. It's one of the responsibilities of the police service. I have a parking enforcement unit. But those officers are in uniform. Their vehicles are marked. They're out in communities, and there are eyes and ears. And so they're, while they're doing one important job for the city, they're also part of our, our, our response to violence in our communities. Okay, but this again, the next question goes towards this allocation of how you use your person power. You can't say manpower anymore, can you? What do you say now? Well, you know, it's a, a shortcut, but you're right. And certainly in my organization, we have lots of women who do every job that every police officer does, and they do it exceptionally well. So let's say resources then. There resources. You go. One of the things I hear is that Tavis is very focused on stopping and searching young people who look like they're up to mischief, and again, pressing minor charges at the expense of those 500 miserable eggs who are terrorizing the whole population. Is that well, a fair criticism? And, and I think, well, first of all, there's a couple of mistakes in there. We're not just stopping and searching randomly. In, in, in Canada, you need a legal authority to conduct a search. My officers are very well trained in that. And, and we're, we hold our people accountable for that. So, so yes, we are stopping and talking to people. We are gathering inf information and intelligence. And where there are grounds to justify, legally justify, a search, those searches might take place. There is some enforcement of, of the law in those places. And it's, it's, it's always a bit of a challenge when you're trying to protect people but you also have to know who's in the neighborhood and what they're up to. And if they're engaged in, in minor criminal activity, also, if, if, we, if we don't deal effectively with the small stuff, the big stuff can take over. It's like the broken window well, theory? Well, I think, I think there's, that's, that's a very important consideration. If, if you allow a lot of the small stuff to take place, what happens is people become fearful about using public space. 
And if, if people won't take their kids to the park, if they won't go out and engage with their neighbors, and if we can't go out and engage with the people that live in that community, then those, those become more dangerous places. They become places where a criminal is more likely to be able to carry a weapon, to victimize somebody, and where violence is going to take place. And so it, one, of, one of our important responsibilities, in addition to dealing with those who are committing offenses, is to help everyone else feel safe mm -hmm. and, and, and encourage and support them in the use of their neighborhoods and in the support of each other. And, and frankly, without the public's cooperation, without the public's full participation, in community safety. We can't be successful. Well, let me follow up on that for our last couple of minutes here because th there, obviously there's only so much the police can do. Uh, in a city of two and a half million people, you're what, 5,000 officers or something like that? Something like that. Okay. So where do you need, for example, social services or community groups to step in to fill the gaps? I think social services perform an incredibly important role. It's one of the reasons I have said many times, you can't arrest your way out of violent problems in your community and that, that there has to be appropriate effective social interventions. I've seen youth workers, and in, in, I'm, I'm a Regent Park guy, I've come, out of, I've come out of Regent Park, and I know youth workers in Regent Park who've done absolutely extraordinary work with young people, providing them with, with good role models, giving them opportunities, helping them build up their self-confidence, be better citizens, far more likely to be successful and par, far less likely to make the bad choices of getting involved in guns and gangs. And so I know that the work of those youth workers and those social interventions can be tremendously important. I've also seen, like we have a program in Toronto it's called the Youth and Policing Initiative. We hire about 150 kids from our priority neighborhoods. I'd love to, frankly, to bring in more, but we've, we've just about reached our capacity in the police service. But I watched the impact that those, the opportunity to, to earn a wage, to, to learn new skills, uh, to, to gain the self-confidence that comes from, from, from a job. I've seen the effect of that. And so when we help young people find work and find you know, that, that self-confidence that comes from those experiences to be successful in school, to get their education, and, and those things all make a huge difference in our, in our neighborhoods for those kids and for community safety. And so there is no one response to making safe neighborhoods. It isn't just a policing issue. It's very much a community, a community issue, a societal issue. And we've got to do a good job of making sure those kids get the opportunities that they need. If somebody makes the wrong choice, not everybody needs to go to jail. Some kids just need to be steered back on the right track and to be supported in that. And those social interventions are, are a huge part of what helps keep our neighborhoods safe places for everybody. Chief Blair, it's always good of you to come to TVO and visit us and uh, share your views on these issues. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.